welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host Definition and with Dracula now dropping on Netflix, it's time to break down everything that you need to know about the limited series. After the show premiered on the BBC earlier in the week, it's had the internet in an uproar and throughout this video we'll be discussing the overall plot, the meaning of its final few scenes and the easter eggs that you may have missed. There will be heavy spoilers here so if you haven't had a chance to watch Dracula yet and don't want to know what happens then I highly suggest that you turn off now. Without the way, I just want to give a huge thank you for clicking this video, now let's get into our breakdown of Dracula. All you have to do is invite me in. Okay, so Dracula initially starts out as a rough adaptation of the Bram Stoker source material before it veers off massively towards the end. Initially, we are introduced to Jonathan Harker in 1897, who recounts his time at Dracula's castle to two sisters. These two sisters become key figures in the first entry, and it's revealed that one of them is Jonathan's fiance and that the other is Van Helsing. The former has been brought in because Jonathan has pretty much had his memory and life force drained from him, though he is able to discuss his time with Dracula in great detail. Van Helsing, on the other hand, has completely lost her faith. However, after hearing the tale that Jonathan provides, she slowly begins to recapture it and we watch as this transforms her belief system throughout the show. In the beginning though, we follow Jonathan as he arrives at the castle where he is met by a very frail and weak old Dracula. However, throughout the first episode, Dracula, Benjamin buttons his way back to the prime of his life, whilst Jonathan deteriorates rapidly. From the off, the show oozes its own unique style that updates the classic legend massively. In addition to this, there is of course the gender switch with Van Helsing, as well as hints that Dracula may be bisexual. Now, this sent some corners of the internet into an uproar, however, Stephen Moffat, who helped develop the show, stated that Dracula isn't bisexual, he's bi-homicidal. The writer later went on to say, he's killing them, not dating them. He's not actually having sex with anyone. He's drinking their blood. The way that I looked at it is that when humans eat meat, we don't really care about the gender that we're consuming. If you're straight, you don't care whether your steak is a male or a female, and this is mirrored in Dracula who consumes without prejudice. Dracula is able to take on the intellect of those he consumes, and he picks up Jonathan's English skills while straining him. He can take a person's memories and intimate details about their life and thus he gains more knowledge the more that he feasts. Later in the show, he refers to this as downloading. This also adds motive for why he wishes to travel to England as he views the population as sophisticated and thinks that this will refine his taste. Though he probably hasn't met me uncle, what an idiot. It's a really unique take on one of our civilization's oldest villains, and in this first episode, Dracula really caught my attention. Jonathan discovers a message carved into a window one night that says help me, and he begins searching for the lost soul. The castle itself is an inescapable fortress, full of twists and turns, and as he delves deeper into it, he discovers more of what is going on beneath the surface. The place is littered with the undead, and as Dracula calls it, his brides, who he is trying to use to reproduce. This is a slight differentiation from the original work, as in that gypsies took refuge in the castle. Harker is eventually bitten by one of his brides, and Dracula takes him to the high point of his home, breaking his neck and seemingly killing him. However, the character reanimates, and with the help of a cross, he's able to escape the castle. This is how he made it to the Covenant to tell his story, and yet it kind of fills in all of the gaps. We realise that he's been brainwashed by Dracula, and that the initial account he provided to the nuns were just ramblings of how he worshipped the Count. Jonathan's fiancée Mina reveals herself, and similar to the book, we discover that she's travelled over from England. There's a little Sherlock easter egg dropped here when Sister Agatha reveals that she used a detective acquaintance in London to help find Mina. For those who don't know, the team behind this also created the BBC version of the show, so yeah, it's a nice little callback. There's also a moment where Jonathan reads a letter from his fiancée Mina, who jokingly says that in his absence she might have an affair with a barmaid from the Rose and Crown. During the Doctor Who Christmas special, The Snowmen, companion Clara Oswald worked at a bar known as The Rose and Crown, and this is a clear tie to Moffat, who also wrote that episode. Before they get a happy reunion though, bats attack and bite Mina, and after this leaves Jonathan craving blood, he decides to commit suicide in order to save her. Outside the convent, a lurking black dog prowls the premises, and this is revealed to be Dracula. 
I loved watching him rip his way out of the creature and it's one of the most terrifying transformations that I've seen in a long long time. As Dracula is a vampire, he cannot enter the convent without being invited in. Agatha teases him with her blood and it's from consuming this that Dracula is able to see her memory and he discovers that her true identity is Van Helsing. Left with little options, Dracula goes to Jonathan who we learn is not actually dead because the undead cannot commit suicide. In exchange for an invitation in, he promises to kill a character, which he does, taking his skin as a costume in the process. Now this is a massive change up from the original work as in that Jonathan ended up surviving till the end. When Mina arrived at the convent she nursed him back to health and the two ended up marrying as well as having a family together. Dracula ravages the convent and finds Mina and Van Helsing using sacramental bread as a barrier. This hammers home that mentally Dracula is still bound by the legends that surround him. We learn that due to his feeding on peasants who were god fearing at the time that he has developed a hate of the cross and slowly his own mental state is what's caused him to believe that he has weaknesses that fit the typical vampire archetypes. We'll get into this more at the end of the video but it massively plays into the recharacterization of Dracula and why he's the way that he is. Using Jonathan's skin, Dracula tricks Mina into inviting him into their circle. We learn that Van Helsing sacrifices herself in order to free Mina and Dracula captures her. It's an awesome callback to the Christopher Lee depiction with the look of the character being almost identical and we learn that Mina later went on to create the Jonathan Harker Foundation that treat diseases throughout the world. Similar to the first episode, the second entry opens with Van Helsing questioning a character. However, this time it's Dracula and he recounts his journey to Whitby in England. Though it seems like she may have outsmarted the character last time, it is revealed that he put her into a deep trance and that he's been using her body almost as a milking cow and slowly feeding upon her. It's creepy as hell and I definitely think that out of the three episodes, this one is probably the high point. Dracula begins making his way to England aboard an ill-fated ship known as the Demeter. Though this entry is a lot simpler plot wise than the prior episode, it still packs a punch and it's where we really get to know the titular character. As the boat makes its way to England, Dracula begins picking off the crew one by one, slowly making them all paranoid that they'll be next and that there's no one on board that they can trust. I actually got a lot of vibes of John Carpenter's 1982 film The Thing, however this time it's from the perspective of the monster. We learn that Dracula intentionally handpicked all of the travellers and he begins hunting them. He improves his German, creates a fog around the boat and manipulates the people on board into turning on one another. However, after they discover Sister Agatha and almost hang her, she proves that it is in fact Dracula behind it all. There's also a nice little easter egg here as Agatha is located inside room number 9. Mark Gaddis, one of the Dracula TV show creators, worked with Steve Pemberton and Reese Shearsmith on the hilarious show The League of Gentlemen. Pemberton and Shearsmith themselves created a show called Inside Number 9 and it is possible that this is a reference to his partner's work. Together they form one last attempt to take Dracula down and he's seemingly defeated but we later learn that he remained on the ship, hiding out in a bed that possessed soil from his native land. In a last ditch attempt to stop him, Agatha decides to destroy the ship and with the help of the captain they manage to sink it just off the coast of England. Dracula's coffin sinks to the bottom of the ocean and we learn that he remained in a comatose restorative state that allowed him to lay at the bottom of the ocean for a century. He was discovered by members of the Jonathan Harker Foundation and they accidentally fed him which ended up reviving him. This is a big twist in the series with the character in fact arriving in modern day. Initially the creative team denied that this would be anything more than a period piece but a Dracula arrives on the shore to come face to face with a woman who appears to be Sister Agatha. Now unfortunately for me, I do feel like from this point onward the show did drop the ball quite a lot. Time jumps can always destroy period pieces and I do feel like this was the case here with the creative team being better equipped to write classical dialogue than what they do with the teenage characters. They pretty much spend way too much time on characters that we don't really care about and almost cut to credits mid sentence which left the finale feeling a bit hollow in my opinion. This episode centres around Zoe Van Helsing who we learn is of the same bloodline of Sister Agatha and she's been attempting to track Dracula down so that she can study him. Zoe has cancer and this could add motive to why she wishes to study the character and why she ends up taking a drop of his blood. 
Dracula is unable to feast upon her as her blood is poisonous due to the disease and we watch as it slowly ravages her from the inside throughout the episode. This studying could be that she wished to find out the secret to his immortality, though her motives are never really developed fully as we spend 15 minutes of the episode in a nightclub. This is where we're introduced to a doctor named Jack who is a member of the Jonathan Harker Foundation. Jack has unrequited love for a girl named Lucy Westerner. Those familiar with the original work will remember that Lucy was a character in the book and that she was the best friend of Mina Murray. Similar to the source material, Lucy ends up becoming the undead and the show mirrors her arc with her eventual death being a big part of it. There's a nice little shining easter egg with the wallpaper in Jack's room possessing the same pattern as the carpet from the Overlook Hotel, but overall I felt like the modern setting lacked the disturbing horror vibe that the first two entries had, except for, except for the graveyard kid. God damn, what the, what the hell was that? <laughs> After Dracula is caged in an almost Hannibal Lecter-esque prison, a lawyer comes and frees him because it is against his rights to be detained. Left with little options, Zoe drinks Dracula's blood and this reawakens the spirit of Agatha who has been travelling with him through his blood to the new world. Dracula discovers Jack's phone and begins seducing Lucy which is when we get another time jump of 3 months. Through Dracula and Lucy's conversations we discover that sometimes when people die their consciousness remains and they become the undead. It's also at this point that Dracula warns Lucy not to be cremated when she dies as this would be extremely painful. It seems like he's finally found the bride that he's been searching for this entire time and he drains her blood almost completely. A friend reaches out to Jack who in turn reaches out to Zoe who is haunted by visions of Agatha. Jack is unable to save Lucy and she becomes the undead, conscious in her body but completely paralysed. She is cremated and then reanimates becoming horribly disfigured. Due to her vanity and twisted perception of the world, Lucy is unable to see this and still believes that she is beautiful. Together Jack and Zoe confront Dracula and Lucy arrives discovering how she really looks upon taking a selfie. Which yeah, again it once more kind of comments on her vanity and how the camera never lies. She breaks down and Jack kills her in some Blade CGI death scene which left me thinking where's Wesley Snipes when you need him. Anyway, after Dracula confesses that he was besotted by Lucy because of her fascination with death, Agatha takes over Zoe and the two begin to talk because she's finally realised what's going on with the character. Now this is where the show probably takes the biggest turn from the source material and after she proves to Dracula that sunlight cannot harm him, she slowly begins to deconstruct his psychology. Dracula is a coward that has been afraid of death his entire life, possibly because all of his ancestors died in combat on the battlefield. Because of this he has subconsciously gained a low opinion of himself and thus he lurks in the shadows, cannot confront God and won't even look at himself in a mirror. It's a nice little subversion of the character and we realise that the main reason for the character's immortality is because deep down he doesn't have the courage to die. What he's most afraid of is the finality of life and because he won't take this final step he in fact has lost and is doomed to live forever as a coward. Zoe on the other hand is at death's door, accepting of her fate and ready to go to the afterlife, leaving the character behind to wallow in the shadows. However, Dracula has a huge change of heart and he steps into the light that also has crosses on it in what is some of the best iconography in the show. Dracula finally accepts that he must die and he drinks Zoe's blood, killing himself in the process. The two dream that they are drifting off into the sun as lovers, which is when the show cuts to black. This is important because Dracula was obsessed over the sun his entire life and he longed to see it once more, finally drifting off into it at the end and this shows that he has embraced the thing deep down that he wanted the most, a death that would come at the hands of it and the Van Helsings. Dracula believed that the sun would kill him and yet he still longed for it, which also shows that deep down he still longed for death. The two lock with one another and fade off as credits begin to roll. But what did I think of the show overall? Well, I had high hopes for this and after an outstanding couple of episodes I was really hopeful that the finale would nail the landing. However, from about the time jump onwards this really lost it for me. I do think that they could have kept it in the past and retained all of the plot elements that were in place in this finale and the time jump it just feels a bit cheap looking back. As a whole though I did enjoy the show and watching it on the BBC night after night has pretty much made up most of my activities in 2020 so far. I did have a lot of fun with it but it's difficult to not get the bad taste out of my mouth from the ending, excuse the pun, so it is quite hard to rate. 
Overall, I did enjoy Dracula more than I didn't, and that's why it gets a 7 out of 10. Now obviously, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Dracula and its ending. Comment below and let me know, and if you enjoyed this video then please give it a thumbs up, and make sure you check out our full breakdown of the Witcher Netflix timeline which is going to be linked at the end. We go over the entire show in chronological order from beginning to end, so it's definitely worth checking out if the show left you confused. If you want to come chat to me after the video then make sure you follow me on Twitter at DefinitionYT, or head over to my Discord server which will be linked in the description below. We drop videos on there early, so if you want to see stuff before anyone else then that's the best place to be. It's free to join and we have an awesome community, so hopefully I'll see you over there very soon. We're also giving away a free copy of Joker, which is one of our favourite movies of the last year, and all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel and leave your thoughts on Dracula in the comments section below. The winner's going to be chosen at random on the 15th of January and the set will be shipped out from then to whoever gets the prize, so best of luck to everyone who takes part. This is a channel for people who are never missing television, so if that's the kind of thing you like, you need to subscribe to Definition. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this, you've been the best and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.